When our last episode was switched off in utter disgust by over 37 million anxious viewers, those two wrongs, Burris and Natasha, were proving they couldn't make a right. A right bad idea. Think, darling, think. There must be something really rotten we can do today. I'm thinking. But the worst I come up with is helping to make Moose and Squirtle show one hour longer. Oh, just like you, darling. Always trying to help others get a little more pain out of life. Then suddenly a thought struck him like a 20,000 volt charge. Boris, you have great idea. No, but I have defective cord on electric pencil sharpener. I have it, darling. A contest. I like being evil because, in 25 words or less... I like it, I like it. And so the twisted and foul contest found its way to people in every walk of life. Hey, Gurney, my lunch is wrapped here in a paper telling about that evil contest. You figure to enter? <coughs> Gurney always was one to try a thing out first before he'd send it in. <coughs> I hate to do this, but I've entered that contest. Help yourself. I'm entering, too, so I've been selling fake jewelry all week. The wife's home with the real stuff. So by the time you find this note, Fred, I will be gone with a swag and maybe first prize in the contest. The contest was racing across the country like wildfire. Oh, it's gratifying to know there's still some bad left in the world. True enough, to enter a contest this vile, one would have to be a pretty low, contemptible, loathsome type. You left out naughty. A loathsome and naughty type, or uh, just plain stupid. Hold up a minute, Rock. I gotta mail this contest entry blank in. Bowwinkle, you mean you entered that Why I Like Evil contest? Evil? I thought it said Weevil. Well, why should you like a Weevil? Because I had distributing rights on them for two years. I almost made a fortune. Almost made a fortune? Well, what happened, Bullwinkle? They had cotton all over them. It drove the prices down. And as sure as the post office department sells four-cent stamps commemorating the birth of Raymond Navarro, Bullwinkle had come up with a winning entry in Boris's despicable contest. Listen to this. I like evil because I have complete distributing rights for it in Musselwania. That's it. First prize. Back at the post office. Bullwinkle, do you realize that you mailed a contest blank that says you have the distributing rights on evil someplace? It's just for Musselvania. Musselvania? What's that? What's that? I wish I could remember. Ah, uh, if only Bullwinkle could remember. Musselvania was and is a small land adjacent to the United States, populated by absolutely no one. Zero people, zero production, zero space development, zero everything. But on the other hand, no taxes, no laws, no traffic, no extradition treaties, and no late, late shows that feature Johnny Downs and Richard Dix as two men lost over a Pacific island. I have it! You have what, Bullwinkle? I have Musselvania. I just remembered. It's been handed down in my family. I'm governor, superintendent, owner, and cleanup janitor. But at that very second that Bullwinkle was delivering those staggeringly funny lines, the contest first prize was speeding its way toward him. What did you send, Boris Sweetovich? A complete set of the encyclopedia bad enough. And? And when you open volume 7, mastered on through Moscox. Which includes Musselvania. And also 237 kilotons of TNT. Package for Bullwinkle J. Moose. Oh, goody. I'll bet it's those Billy Sol seed kits I ordered from the Department of Agriculture. Oh, what can happen on our next nerve pulsating episode? Blast off Speedia with Encyclopedia or off to heaven with Volume 7? In our last episode, Boris Badenov and his equally vicious friend Natasha had found the perfect way to acquire a lifetime supply of fiendishly tricky ideas. A contest. I like evil because in 25 words or less. It could be even bigger than the Sonny Tufts for President movement. And it was. Entries poured in from every corner of the world. Merle, don't you think as astronauts we ought to tell them the Earth ain't round, it's got corners? Shucks, Otis, lying to him might be a way to win that evil contest. Shifty people everywhere responded in 25 words or less. Shifty. Or those whose cerebral functions respond conversely to the impulse transitions normally required for a motory reflex action. Or in other words, stupid. Well, I've mailed my contest blank. Bullwinkle, you've entered the evil contest. Oh, I thought it was Weevil. And you guessed it, Bullwinkle has been judged first prize winner. And the first prize was a complete set of the Encyclopedia Badenov, designed to eradicate Bullwinkle and Rocky. When they turn to Volume 7, Mastodon through Moscox, Musselvania will be a boomtown. Mastodon, Macedonia, mulching, it's here someplace. Now, darling, he has turned to Musselvania. Monocle. Mother, here it is, Rock, Musylvania. Four, three, two, one. Says here, Musylvania, although eminently qualified for statehood in the U.S., has never made the grade. Huh, wonder why? 
If the flash lasts this long, the boom will be a Lulu. No flash and no boom boom Lulu, Boris. And Bullwinkle read on about the tragically narrow misses Mussylvania had had in its fight for statehood. Then it is agreed, gentlemen, that the 13 original colonies shall join with Mussylvania and become the 14 United States of America. Hey, hold it! When you bring a job to the Betsy Ross Flag Manufacturing Company, there ain't no alterations included. Now, if you want 14 stars instead of 13, that comes extra. Yes, Mussylvania was the first victim of government's fight against deficit spending. Over and over again, Mussolvania had narrowly missed statehood, and as Bullwinkle read on, tears formed in his sympathetic eyes. Golly, Bullwinkle, why are you crying? Well, Rock, it's because... Hello, Moose and Squirrel, first place contest winners. You sure you're reading about Mussolvania? Nope. That's why I was crying, because I can't read, and I was running out of stuff I'd memorized. Look, Moose, you got the wrong book. Eureka through Glefnish. Show him, wonderful twisted genius. See? Mastodon, Macedonia, Mulching. Boris, no. Mussolvania. But seconds before the dreadful explosion, Rocky and Bullwinkle had slipped away to catch the 526 for Washington, D.C., where they were about to launch a gigantic campaign. State hood for Mussolvania, Rock. Just think. Golly, Bullwinkle, just like Hawaii and Alaska. Gee whiz, Rock, they trying to get it, too? But as the train flashed on, Boris Badenov was no longer idle. Boris, the moose and squirrel, they left on train for Washington. Is all part of prearranged master plan. How despicably clever of you, Dalek. You mean train is... Exactly. Had it for fake Washington, D.C. Is really Butte, Montana, completely disguised to look like capital of U.S. What unspeakably twisted scheme does Boris have in mind? We'll find out in our next episode called Resign Your Fate to a 50-Second State or Mussolvania Mania. When our last marrow freezing episode reached its nearly unbearable climax, our two principals, Rocky and Bullwinkle, were hurtling purposefully toward what they thought was Washington, D.C. Now, let's see, Rock. What were we going to do in Washington? Gosh, Bullwinkle, you forgot already. We're going to file for statehood for Mussolvania. Oh, that's right. That way, Mussolvania can set an example for Texas. But what Bullwinkle and Rocky didn't know was that they were streaming straight for Butte, Montana, which had been cleverly disguised as our nation's capital by no one else than Boris Badenov and his femme fatality, Natasha. Wait till Moose and Squirrel see authentic artificial simulated fake capital. But, Dalek, why you do this? If Mussolvania becomes a real state in real Washington, we lose chance for distribution rights for evil. Is clear, Boris, precious monster, but why you put Frankenstein on top of Capitol Dome? And while Boris erected the sham Washington, D.C. as a part of a truly sinister scheme, the citizens of Butte, Montana, scarcely took notice. Hey, Merle, some nut come a-running in here and ask me if I'd wear the Supreme Court robe. I know, Selwyn. I used to just want to hit you in the mouth. Now I want to impeach you. The nerve of that feller, Mother, bending our antenna like that. Now Channel 4 don't get nothing but the presidential press conferences. Don't move, Dad. He told me I was the new curator of the Smithsonian, and now I'm putting you on display with that old typewriter. At that identical moment, Rocky and Bullwinkle were nearing their mistaken destination. Gee, Bullwinkle, our nation's capital off there in the distance. Doesn't it give you a special feeling? Yeah, Rock. Almost like the feeling I got first time I saw Butte, Montana. Yeah, just look at that gold dome. Funny, I thought Frankenstein was green. And as Rocky and Bullwinkle pulled into the station, a familiar voice could be heard behind an impenetrable disguise. Hey, Moose and Squirrel, give you a nice tour of capital. That voice! Where have I heard that voice before? In about 324 other episodes. But I don't know who it is either. Pardon me, Mr. Guy, but we represent Mussolvania, and we'd like you to take us where we can file for statehood. How about in here, Rock? Bullwinkle, that's the wrong building. That's the Bureau of Weights and Measures. Oh, yeah. I guess that's why I got this card with a picture of Peter Lawford on one side, along with 162 pounds and my fortune. Here it is, U.S. Capitol. Here's where old mooses and squirrels files for statehood. Thanks, mister. Yeah, and thanks for tying this handkerchief around my eyes, too. But barely a few yards away, a shadowy figure stood ready to perform an unbelievably treacherous act. Now, Boris. You ain't just whistling Dixie, kid. Now. Hey, wait a minute. You're no guide. And that doesn't look like the Capitol building. 
Come on, Bullwinkle, let's get out of here. But it was too late, for no matter how fast they ran, Rocky and Bullwinkle were in the direct path of the falling phony capital. Rock, you mean the capital isn't really made out of one quarter inch beaver board with plastic clamps? Run, Bullwinkle! I thought you only ran in Washington every fourth year. Run for your life, Bullwinkle! Sounds like as good a reason as any, Rock. Will our two speedy specimens escape certain squashing death by the giant 13,000-ton beaverboard capital replica? Watch out on our next nerve-spattering episode titled Bad Day at Flat Rocky or A Record in Bullwinkle's Blunt. In our last spleen-shaking episode, our two Musselvania mentors had journeyed to what they thought was Washington, D.C., but which was actually just Butte, Montana, which had been sinisterly disguised by, you guessed it, Boris Badenov and Natasha. Now, Boris, cruel, sweetie. Now. Faster, Bullwinkle, faster! What, and get arrested for impersonating a jet? You Bullwinkle, it's okay. We can stop now. Do we have to, Rock? I just love to hear the wind whistle through my antlers when I'm doing over 60. Boris, baby, where did we fail? <laughs> and I always try so hard to do the wrong thing. Hey, who cares if Moose and Squirrel not squashed? It's impossible to file for statehood for Musylvania in Butte, Montana, anyway. So true, my dearest twisted genius. But was it true? Look, behind where that artificial capital was, there's the Butte, Montana Lumber Company, and it's fallen, too. What do you say to that, Bullwinkle? What else, Rock? Timber! And falling it was, right on Boris Badenov who had no way of knowing that he had not disguised Butte, Montana as Washington, D.C. It was actually Washington, D.C. that had been rigged up to look like Butte, Montana by a clever pressure group in the pay of the Montana Muskmelon Trust. Senator, here we decorated this year whole town to look like Butte, Montana, and still you're voting against our muskmelon bill? Son, I even voted against Medicare, and they wrapped 54 million band-aids on the Washington Monument. Well, anyway, it really was Washington, D.C., and at that very moment, Rocky and Bullwinkle were entering the Capitol building with their petition for statehood for Musylvania. This is it, Bullwinkle. Look, they even have a window marked Musylvania. Hey, Moose and Squirrel, Musylvania is explosive issue. Better hurry, window is closing in one minute in honor of Aaron Burr. Hey, isn't he the one that shot Alexander Hamilton? That's why the window is closing. I got to warn him to get out of town. Well, then give him the petition, Bullwinkle. Okay, Rock, but you better hold this for me. Thank you, Moose and Squirrel. Now Musylvania is never having statehood. Bullwinkle, we gave them our petition and they were fake. Oh, well, at least we still got this little gift that lobbyist from the pressure group gave me. What pressure group? I believe he said it was the New Mexico Dynamite and TNT Trust. Golly, Bullwinkle, this isn't it. This is the petition. Then you mean... And once again, Bullwinkle's incredible stupidity had saved the day, for at that very minute, a blinding flash covered the entire metropolitan Washington, D.C. area and parts of Elko, Nevada as well. Boris, if angle of trajectory is right, we orbit Earth every seven minutes. See, I was right. Musylvania statehood was explosive issue. Back at the Capitol building, two friendly hands met in congratulations for a momentous event, affecting 185 million Americans. Well, that's it, Bullwinkle. It's filed. You mean Musylvania's gonna be a state now, Rock? That all depends on how many good Americans get behind it, Bullwinkle. But will Rocky and Bullwinkle be joined in support by people everywhere? Or will the same sinister forces that defeated the Snooky Lanson presidential boom be at work again? Perhaps we'll find out more in further adventures of Rocky Squirrel and Bullwinkle J. Moose. <laughs> 